Good evening to all of you. Uh, it's wonderful feeling happy to be with you all today evening. Uh, in the next 20, 25 minutes or so, I shall share with you a uh, few cases of coronary perforations and try to discuss with you uh, regarding how probably one could avoid it and how to manage once you encounter coronary dissections. That's my disclosure. I have encountered, encountered many perforations. I should con confess that whatever I'm proceeding over here, Many of, us, many of these cases were created by me, uh, except few of them. Now to start with, we know that coronary perforations can happen one in thousand. The management would be prompt recognition and treatment. Now how do we recognize when you develop a coronary dissection? To start with, the patient becomes hypotensive. You could see the respiratory variation of central atrial pressure on the monitor. You could have tachycardia or bradycardia, vagal response, patient starts yawning. And most important thing would be you could see contrast extravasation on angiography. And when you have a delayed wire-induced cardiac tamponade, probably echo should be the guide to make you understand that you have a perforation in the distal vessel that, can, that has led to hypotension. Now, in general, the treatment principles would be the first response when you have a coronary perforation to seal the perforations, you do a balloon dilatation and try to seal the perforation so that you do not have leak into the pericardium, cardiac tamponade and hypotension. As Matthew Samuel sir has told, do not panic. Immediately get an assistance from your friend. At least you need to have an anesthetist with you, somebody who can help you out with the echocardiogram. One should try to restore the hemodynamic compromise. Try to start doing pericardiosynthesis mm -hmm. if there is significant hypotension. Start fluids, vasopressors and ultimate options would be IABP and ECMO. Now, reversal of heparin is always a controversial issue. Now, we, we always try to reverse uh, partially the heparin action by giving around, let's say, 1, uh, 7,000 units of heparin for the patient. We try to partially rever reverse it by giving 25 to 35 milligram of protein so that at least 50% of heparin action could be reversed. And again, you have uh, regarding glycoprotein 2 beta receptor blockers, abseximab could be reversed by platelet transfusion. Now, regarding uh, the classification, uh, you could have uh, you could have type one type one leak, a crater extending outside the lumen, contrast not going into the pericardium. Type two would be the contrast going into the pericardium, but it's not a free flow. And type three, you have a jet going into the pericardium, which is more dangerous. Now, regarding prevention of leak in type 1 pericardial, uh, type 1 coronary perforation, uh, this is a case example. You could, uh, this is a patient who had a tight stenosis of the mid-left anterior descending artery. We wired the lesion. Uh, we did a balloon dilatation. We did a stent implantation. You could see that the stent is not uh, properly open in the mid portion. So we tried to do a post dilatation. This was done long back when we, when we were doing post dilatation mm -hmm. with short mm -hmm. semi-compliant balloons. You could Plus, see that this, this balloon is open in such a way that uh, you could see that um, approximately it's opened up very well and this leaves not open. So once you see these sort of things, you you know that it's likely to uh, produce a perforation on your vessel. Now, the next should be found out that there was a perforation, it was a type 1 leak. It was not going into the pericardium. So the next knee-jerk response was to dilate that balloon at low pressures over there itself. Immediately, we dilated the balloon there. The, the most important thing would be to recognize that you have a perforation before you pull out the balloon from the coronary. So what you do is every time you do a stent implantation, every time you do a post dilatation, before pulling out the balloon into the guide catheter, always take a small check shoot. Make sure that there is no dissection, there is no perforation in the vessel, and then pull out the balloon balloon catheter. Now, if you find, find out that there is a small perforation, you could immediately dilate the balloon at lower pressures so that you could avoid cardiac tamper. You are always likely to have perforations during your coronary interventions, but then it's okay as long as you do not have a cardiac tamponade, you can manage and the get and get back the patient very safely. So the first thing that you would do is to dilate the balloon at low pressures and make sure that is that there is no no leak. You could you could always wait for up to ten minutes and uh, then deflate the balloon and recheck whether you have any problem. Still, the major challenge would be. 
uh, you have uh, you have distal ischemia when you have a proximal LED perforation when you have a dilated balloon in the proximal LED you are likely to have a distal ischemia in these sort of situations. So how could you get tied over this particular situation? Um, you could you could always use something known as the distal perfusion technique. You could go to the opposite groin. Or oh, have a guide catheter inserted into the coronary, slowly deflate your inflated balloon, wire with another wire, wire the lesion, and then take a micro catheter, distill, distill to the balloon like what you see in this particular image, and then you can probably take blood from the guy uh, from the arterial site and perfuse distally. So this is one technique that has been explained to prevent distal ischemia when you have a balloon inflated for a prolonged period of time in the proximal vessels. Now coming back to our patient, we kept the balloon dilated for a while and slowly, slowly the perforation healed. And then we we, we didn't want to further post dilate with the, uh, in the proximal portion, we left the patient left alone at that point of time. So the message is never try to post dilate any any stented segment with semi compliant balloon it always has to be a uh, it has to be a non compliant balloon so that you don't have this unequal expansion of the balloon and leading onto perforation now coming to type 2 and type 3 perforations how do you how do you manage the leak how do you manage the perforation now this was a patient who presented with an effort engine i approximately LED tight stenosis this was done by one of our junior junior juniors who was not well experienced with stent uh, coronary coronary uh, interventions so he in, uh, he uh, went through the femoral approach it was uh, the vessel was um, engaged with a extra backup guide catheter it was wired balloon dilatation was done and following that stent implantation was done now what happened was uh, when he asked for a three millimeter stent we had a junior technician who gave a four millimeter stent that was a four millimeter stent implanted inside the left anterior descending artery by by the way the operator did not notice that it was a huge stent that was deployed in the proximal left anterior descending artery he deployed the stent and he removed the balloon also from the from the stented portion and uh, the balloon came out once the balloon balloon came out the patient had a uh, cardiac tamponade hypotension and cardiac arrest so uh, cpr was started fortunately fortunately the balloon the wire was inside the left anterior descending artery and uh, the wire was not pulled out so it was easy for us we all joined the team and we immediately took a balloon uh, it was a four millimeter stand we took a four millimeter balloon and inflated it at um, six atmospheres in the proximal portion now we also disengage the guide catheter why do we disengage the guide catheter primarily because we are trying to partially reverse the heparin effect so when you give protamine there is always a chance that you are likely to have clot inside the guide catheter so always try to disengage the guide catheter from the coronary ostium now the next thing would be to the, remove the remove the contra remove the blood from the pericardium. Now you could uh, you could see these two needles over there. The, the one low down there is the regular one that we use for the femoral puncture, and the up, upper one is a longer one. That's a, that's a epidural puncture needle. This needle is a better option because it's much longer than the regular regular needle that we use for puncturing the femoral artery. So now go to the pericardium, aspirate the pericardium. So the first step you inflate the balloon, disengage the guide catheter, try to part partly reverse the heparin effect, uh, try to relieve the tamponade by having a pictal catheter inside the um, inside the uh, pericardium. Now the next thing what you would do is uh, to keep the balloon inflated for a long time. We try to deflate the balloon and see. Now you could see that the, the perforation is partly healing but then it's not really uh, totally sealed off. So next thought of us was to go ahead with a graph master that's a graph master going through the six french guiding catheter that's a four millimeter graph master we deployed the graph master in the proximal left end descending artery at the at the site of the stenosis so graph master is primarily two stents and you have a ptfe metal material sandwich between these two stents so it becomes big bulky device and less, less deliver, deliverable device that's what we all feel so but then this particular stent has uh, uh, saved lot of patients uh, following perforations now you could also use this dual guide technique to minimize the blood leak into the pericardium so when you have a perforation you dilate the balloon at low pressures do not deflate the balloon now go to the opposite groin uh, punch the opposite groin go with the second guide catheter uh, disengage your first guide catheter and engage with your second guide catheter and once you engage with your second guide catheter you can you can wire the 
slowly deflate the balloon wire through the side of the side of the balloon and then through the second guide catheter you can always take your covered stent so that uh, the time that you waste in removing the balloon and taking the covered stent into the coronary artery coronary artery could be minimized so that you can avoid a, a avoid a cardiac tamponade now this is just the example of that you have a distal dissection following a stent implantation inside the vessel so the balloon is immediately uh, dilated so that the pericardial leak pericardial tamponade could be avoided and following that you could see that there are two guide catheters the first one needs to be disengaged the second one needs to be engaged and then you wire wire by the side of the first first balloon and first wire and then deflate the balloon take it out immediately get the stent the covered stent distally deploy it and so that you can avoid cardiac tamponade so this is just to minimize the time uh, wherein you are likely to likely to develop a cardiac tamponade by the time you remove the balloon which is inflated there and when you take the covered stent inside you tend to waste maybe 30 seconds or so so that time you can have cardiac tamponade in order to avoid that you could use a dual guide catheter now this is basically the papyrus uh, pk papyrus um, covered stent it goes through the goes through the five french catheters also you you do not have two stents and the covered uh, the the ptf material standard sandwich with, with uh, inside these two stents here what you have is you have the ptf material switcher to the stent so that the profile is left compared to the papyrus stent now if you don't have a covered stent what do, what do you do next you could use a we uh, autologous venous covers only challenge would be you need to have the surgeon he needs to uh, go go to the lower limb get a vein for you then you need to stitch it, stitch it to, to the stent and then go inside the inside the coronary and uh, deploy the stent but then it's a cumbersome procedure when you are stressed inside the capilla with the perforation this is always difficult for you when you are in a desperate situation when you do not have an option this is uh, something that is advocated by the chinese you have the tagaderm inside the capilla and the one that used to fix the cannulas you can take this cup tagaderm you can seal it over the you can uh, you can uh, wrap it around the stent a regular stent uh, probably you need to wrap it two or three times around the stent go inside and deploy it so that's the easiest way of preparing a covered stent for yourself when you do not have a covered stent covered stent available in the shelf now coming back to our patient we used a 4 4 mm covered stent in the proximal left end of the artery we also had to post dilate it and finally we could uh, seal the perforation we could achieve flow inside the vessel and uh, finally we left the a uh, pigtail catheter overnight and next day we remove the pigtail catheter always do not remove the pigtail immediately keep it uh, overnight and probably you need to make sure that there is no further leak into the pericardium and uh, next day probably you could remove it now the message is after stenting as well as post dilatation do a check injection before you pull out the balloon make sure that you do not have a perforation inside the vessel if you see a perforation you can immediately dilate the balloon there and try to avoid the tamponade inside the vessel now coming back to type 2 how to prevent the leak this is an 83 year old gentleman with an acute coronary syndrome you could see a calcified right coronary artery our plan was to open up the proximal as well as distal vessel we started with a six french guide catheter through the uh, radial approach that's in short amplex catheter there was calcium so we expected some challenges so that's the reason why we started with a short amplex catheter it provides a better guide catheter support and you could avoid dissection with this Uh, guide catheter so we dilated with the 3 mm balloon you could see that the stent the vessel has opened up well and we used a 4 mm 438 mm stent to uh, deploy at the proximal stent now now once we deployed the stent you could see that there is a dissection over there and this is not a free flowing there is a perforation there it's not a free flowing perforation into the pericardium you could see that the contrast is receding into the pericardium now uh, we had bit bit time for us to think about think about it so what we did was we immediately dilated the balloon and we waited for 15 minutes we waited for 20 minutes things were not improving we gave 25 mg of protamine tried to reverse the heparin effect partly it was persisting leak so we thought about a covered stent now the challenge is we were working with a six french guide catheter the vessel is little bit up going something like a shepherd crow so that uh, the graft must have would not go into the vessel it could easily track through the through the guide catheter a six french guide catheter but we were not able to take that bent with the graft master so we wanted to use a uh, guide sila 
now this is a uh, six french guide ke theta compatible guides illa uh, we always used to feel that um, even though the graph must it save lot of lives lives we it always has a uh, uh, it, we, everyone used to think that this is a bulky device it's uh, difficult to get, get the graph master through the six friend guide ke theta but in contrary to that we were able to easily get the get the graph master through the guide sila also from, uh, from a six french compatible guide sila you have an inter it's a it's almost something like a five french guide catheter so even through this guide sila we were able to take a four millimeter graph master into the vessel so that was just to show you that over the inflated balloon we could take the uh, uh, guide sila inside the vessel and following that through the guide sila we were able to take a four millimeter graph master into the vessel now you could see that it was bit push and pull you could see that the graph the first image the guide catheter is just outside the coronary ostium but as we started deploying the guide catheter what happened was the stent distally got dislodged di little bit distally what happened was the guide as it was remaining outside the coronary it just moved inside the inside the coronary and the guide sila also moved distally and the stent moved distally it was very unfortunate for us we started dilating it we made out that the stent had moved distally when we partly dilated the stent we stopped dilating it we tried to pull it out distally approximately little bit but then it was not possible it was partly dilated stent so finally we had to deploy the stent there and we were at a loss you could see here that the stent was deployed distally we missed the lesion just because it, uh, it, the guide catheter moved in and the guide sila moved in and the stent also moved in and we missed the lesion so as expected following the stent deployment you could see that the, uh, the perforation is still persisting so we pull back the balloon a little bit and try to dilate it further again we didn't we didn't succeed the perforation was still persisting then the next thing what we tried to do was it was a huge vessel it was a 4.5 mm vessel so we tried to take a 4.5 mm vessel uh, 4.5 mm balloon inside that we tried to dilate the uh, first uh, first covered stent it was not sealing now we uh, we took a second covered stent it was a smaller covered stent that was available with us we had we didn't have a four uh, four millimeter second stent so we used a three millimeter covered stent and deployed it proximally in spite of that the perforation was persisting we further dilated with a 4.5 millimeter balloon and again the perforation was persisting now the only option that we had was to use a 4.5 millimeter covered stent that was available in the shelf because no other way the perforation was sealing down so we try to take a 4.5 mm graph master through the six french compatible guide sila it got stuck at this point of time so keep in mind that even a 4 mm graph master can go through a, a guide sila inside a six french guide catheter now the 4.5 mm graph master wouldn't go through that so at that point of time what we had to do was we had to go through the femoral approach we we went for a seven french guide catheter through the seven french guide catheter we had to take a seven french compatible guide sila that's the seven french compatible guide sila inside the vessel and through that we were able to take the 4.5 mm graph master and that was dis uh, deployed exactly in position and following that we were able to seal the perforation this was just this case was just to highlight the uh, the usefulness of guide sila to track the uh, track the covered stent inside the vessels as well as well just to make make you aware that the graph master can easily track through six french guide catheters and even through six french guide catheters as well as guide sila inside the six french guide catheters now this was another unfortunate patient um uh, you have a, this this particular patient had an acute coronary syndrome and you could see that there is a tight lesion we Uh, got a stent directly there and deployed the stent and following deployment of the stent that is 4 mm stent in the proximal right coronary artery and following deployment of the stent you could see that this is a type 3 dissection there is a free flow into the into the pericardium you could see here that um, before we pulled out the balloon we made a short injection and made out that there was a perforation the next step is to immediately dilate the balloon there. so we dilate the balloon there and we try to reverse the heparin effect partly and following that what we try to do was we knew we knew that it was a free flowing perforation so we need to have a graft master coming in so what we try to do was we try to go through the femoral approach and we took a six french guide catheter you could see in the second frame that the six french guide catheter has reached till the ascending aorta next what we did was we disengaged the first guide catheter and took the second second guide catheter into the coronary artery 
then we slowly deflated the balloon we uh, we in deflated the balloon wired it immediately with the immediately with the fielder fc wire we also had a covered stent inside the second guide catheter that's the, you could see the wiring being done and once the wiring was done we removed the first balloon into the first guide catheter and immediately took a graft master into that now now the patient was so unfortunate that um, we kept the kept the stent in position we started inflating it 2 4 6 8 10 12 14 and 16 and the stent was not opening uh, now what happened was there was some technical technical defect with this uh, product defect with this particular graph master it was on the shelf for a very long time so it didn't the balloon didn't open up and um, the stent was not opening up inside the coronary this is where the prayer helps us every time we start doing an intervention we need to pray that these sort of unfortunate things do not happen to our patient now now we were left with no other options we had to remove this stent and we need we had to take another stent go inside the vessel and we need we had to deploy that's a second stent uh, so you could see here that uh, uh, we had to remove the first stent the, the the perforation was still flowing into the pericardium by this time patient developed cardiac champagne and then we had to go with the next stent the second stent was deployed there it was post dilated and finally the perforation seal but unfortunately we had a cardiac champagne the perforation seal that was the final result unfortunately there was cardiac champagne we had to go with the pigtail catheter we removed the uh, flu blood from the pericardium and uh, five days he was on ventilator he had, uh, there was persistent um, minute leak into the pericardium and finally we removed the pigtail and we were able to send the patient home mm -hmm. on day 60 unfortunately this particular patient survived now how do we prevent leaks how do we prevent distal leaks now prevention of leak uh, on, uh, regarding distal leaks um, you have different options. One, you could occlude a small balloon distally inside the wire induced perforation area. Secondly, you could use a micro catheter which can be advanced into the distal target vessel and you can do a suction so that the vessel could be collapsed and the leak could be prevented. And if the bleeding persists, in distal leaks, you can always embolize the vessel with coils, gel form, or PVA particles. We prefer using coils because you have a controlled, controlled delivery of the coil. PVA particles, you are not sure how much you are going to embolize distally gel form. You are not sure how much of what portion of the vessel you are going to embolize. So we try using coils whenever we have a perforation. That's an example for that. A patient with an inferior myocardial infarction, you can see that uh, we wired the lesion and then we try to uh, dilate it, aspirate it, stent it. And uh, in the second image, you could see that the wire is inside a small PLV branch. And following stenting, you could see that there is a small distal perforation in the inside the PLV branch. Now we waited for a while that uh, was not now not settling down. So what we tried to do was we. Uh, we dilated a small balloon in the distal PLV branch. It was not settling down. Then we tried to get the microcatheter distally and we tried to uh, do suction so that hoping that the balloon would collapse around the negative effect, negative suction effect. It did not happen. And finally, we had to go with a microcoil. So we embolized it uh, with two microcoils, Owen A. Cook's microcoil. And uh, this was taken over a prograde catheter. Uh, one should keep in mind that Owen A. coils wouldn't go through the fine cross catheter you need to have a prograde catheter prograde catheter is uh, compact uh, uh, can take up one eight coil so micro coils were loaded inside that and we pushed with a miracle wire again pushing these micro coils into the distal coronary that is also difficult in many of the situations so we use this miracle wires to push it distally into the vessel so we finally deployed two coils inside the distal vessel and this will plv branch and finally we were able to get away get away with that that's a fine that's a final result in the perforation see so one should one should be careful while man, while doing intervention with the distal tip of the wire make sure that the hydrophilic wires do not perforate inside the distal vessel if at all it perforate make sure that in the final shoot make sure that there is no distal perforation if you encounter a distal perforation wait in the cath lab make sure that it's sealed down before you shift the patient out of the cath lab and if it doesn't settle down probably you need to embolize it or or settle the issue before you get the patient out of the cath lab. Now, when do we think about surgery when you have a large perforation with severe ischemia, when you're not able to recross with the guide bearer, when, you, when you're not able to do proper pericardiosynthesis, when the bleeding continues despite trying all options, think about surgical management. Now, we know that when you have a perforation, it's very stressful for us, and um, uh, many of the time, the 
there are there are at least few patients who succumb to perforation so one ounce of perf uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure so how do we prevent perforations one should always be careful with the balloons uh, use non compliant balloon balloons for post dilatation do not use semi compliant balloons for post dilatation do not oversize balloons when you are in doubt regarding the vessel size try to use an ivs or a ct look for pinhole ruptures before using oxford balloons make sure that there is no jet effect like this you could when you use an oxford balloon uh, make sure that there is no perforation uh, pinpoint perforation like this because these sort of perforations can lead on to problems now moreover sorry uh again after high pressure balloon dilatation it should be made a dictum to have an immediate check injection to keep the balloon ready and also to keep the balloon ready for re advancement if you have a perforation inside the vessel so do not pull out the balloon before you do a check shoot make sure that there is no perforation now while pulling out the balloons after stenting as well as after post dilatation make sure that the guide catheter doesn't get sucked into the coronary if the guide catheter gets sucked into the coronary the distal tip of the wire can migrate distally and this can lead on to distal perforation so make sure that when you pull out the balloons from the uh, from the coronary the guide catheter does not get sucked into the coronary and uh, that that can lead on to distal wire perforation now my first two cases you know that these two were preventable the first case i should have used a non compliant balloon for post dilatation it could have been prevented the second case, second case it was an oversized stent that produced the vessel regarding to avoid distal perforation always practice contralateral coronary injection in cto interventions make sure that the wire is in the true lumen before balloon dilatation avoid hydrophilic and stiff wires distally in small branches always exchange with floppy wire once the balloon crosses the lesion always have the tip of the wire under fluoroscopic vision throughout the procedure to avoid exit perforations and when you have a difficult lesion when you try to jack hammer the balloon inside the lesion always take care of the distal wire now again the third case also it was a preventable situation the distal wire has gone distally and it had perforated distally and we had to finally embolize it with coils so the, all the three cases probably we could have prevented it if we were to be more careful now one should always be careful with the wires when you work with a cto this was an example for that uh, that was um, this was done long back we used a cross it 200 wire the cross it across the lesion the balloon was not crossing the lesion so we were trying to push it across we were trying to jack hammer it into the into the lesion now the balloon would not cross the lesion so we used an anchor balloon technique and with the help of anchor balloon technique we were able to get the balloon across now you could see here that the wire the cross it wire it is well inside a small branch in the distal vessel you could see that it's doubled up there it's inside a small branch it is not inside the main vessel so this probably should be taken care when when you when you do the cto interventions and we, the patient was very fortunate that even though the wire had gone distally and perforated the perforation seen here it's into into a chamber so that the patient did not develop tamponade and we were able to get away with that so make sure that uh, when you when you have the wire inside the vessel the wire shouldn't be inside a inside a uh, smaller branch and that should that point should be kept clear and uh, this was another patient who had a proximal cto and had long back uh, you could see here that there are bridging collaterals uh, we tried to cross it with a cross it wire cross it 200 wire the wire had gone distally uh, it has gone outside the vessel one should, one can always be happy if your patient is not on glycoprotein 2b3 receptor blocker and if you do not balloon dilate it you are unlikely to have a cardiac tamponade so what we what we did in this particular situation was to keep the wire there in the pericardium we crossed the lesion with a different wire a second wire and stented the stented the lesion and then we pulled out the first wire so when you have a wire going out into the pericardium many a times you you get away without having a cardiac tamponade if you do not dilate the lesion you, if your balloon is balloon is uh, you have in balloon the lesion and if the patient is not on like a protein 3a receptor blocker now this is another patient who had a double cto you 
could see that there is a proximal coronary occlusion in the contralateral injection you could see that there is a distal occlusion near the pda so again in this particular patient we crossed with a uh, with a uh, gaia wire you could see that there is a proximal occlusion you could see that there is a distal occlusion we crossed with a gaia wire and the gaia wire had gone into the pda which was confirmed with the contralateral injection and now the next thing that was uh, challenging was to get the wire balloon across the lesion we were easily able to we were able to get the balloon across the first cto but then the balloon wouldn't go into the uh, distal cto now you could see that we were trying to jack hammer it and um, uh, as we were trying to jack hammer you could see that the wire is going here and there into pda plv it was moving here and there and this should probably be avoided so at this point of time what we tried to do was we tried to dilate the proximal lesion we stented the proximal lesion now Uh, as we stented the proximal lesion we had a buried wire over there we had a second wire that was that was a run through wire that was uh, buried behind the stent and with this anchor with this buried wire technique we were able to take a balloon uh, distally you could see here that the wire is gone distally mm -hmm. we could take a second smaller balloon distally you could see that the balloon is coming through the guide catheter we were able to take it distally into the vessel and finally we were able to dilate it stent it and uh, we were able to uh, get a reasonable result just to highlight the fact that uh, while doing ctu intervention we are jack hammering while uh, while pushing the balloon across make sure that the wire doesn't go distally into the smaller vessel and perforate that particular vessel now that is my last case one should always be careful about the using devices also like angioscalp and cutting balloon this was a patient who had a left main critical stenosis you could see that the ostium of the left main has got a very critical stenosis so uh, there was some amount of calcium there also we went through the femoral approach that was a jackins catheter we we wired it we tried to dilate it you could see that um, there was melon seeding so we wanted to go with an angioscalp so before using an angioscalp we um, we tried to assess the balloon size uh, vessel size with the help of a uh, ios evaluation the, you could see that the left main is almost 4.5 mm proximal left end it is being at was 3.5 mm so used a 3.5 mm angioscalp and we tried to dilate it at the left main as well as the proximal led now uh, i i was made as aware that the proximal led was 3.5 mm in size and so that was the reason why we used uh, the angioscalp 3.5 for proximal led dilatation now you could see here that there was a major perforation in the proximal left end descending artery in spite of using an appropriate size balloon the 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 message in this particular case would be whenever you see a 3.5 mm balloon when you want to use an angioscalp or a cutting balloon probably one needs to undersize it probably 0.2533 would have been the ideal ideal balloon for probably uh, dilating this particular proximal left end descending artery even though it was a 3.5 mm vessel based on the ivs then finally we had to do balloon uh, balloon dilatation over there we waited for a while and finally the patient was lucky we stented the left main we had a covered stent in the proximal left end descending artery and we got away without having any uh, cardiac tamponade and that was the result patient is doing well in the long term it's it was done almost 2 years back and patient is uh, doing well now the old saying luck favors the prepared mind so every cath lab should have a pericardial aspiration tray in your cath lab every time you have a perforation get the tray ready immediately you need to have a graft master all sizes should be available in the cath lab you need to have this cooks and microembolization coils and finally these sort of smaller echo machines the v scan you open the machine 10 seconds you get the image so any other echo machine it, it takes very long time for it to start itself so you need to have these sort of smaller echo machines also every cath lab should be equipped with these sort of equipment so in closing regarding the management of perforations prevention is the key but when it happens spray hard do not panic go through all the steps meticulously and hope for a good outcome thank you so much thank you excellent and uh, deepak you covered the whole scenario of uh, perforations excellent uh, with the excellent case and uh, the uh, it's uh, i always say that uh, a good intervention and in the also cardiology is a thinking surgeon because you have to be adapting towards uh, uh, situation and keep changing your strategies depending on situation you saw deepak showing different situations where he used 
different techniques of bringing in guiding catheters, changing guiding catheters, two guiding catheters to tide over the crisis and situations. See, this is what you have to develop an adaptation which will save you in a difficult situation how to get out. Uh, excellent techniques, and especially that balloon trapping, the wire trapping, and trying to get, get uh, a second wire in, and changing the strategies was very, very good technique. I wish you, all of you will learn from that. And uh, uh, the point of pulling the balloon back after, especially the high-profile balloons, MC balloons, and long stem balloons. Watch out long stems. After deploying a long stem, pulling that balloon back, both this pertains to the presentation of ceremony as well as Deepak. Watch out your guiding catheters. When you pull the balloon back, guiding catheters, 99%, if you are not careful, careful will dive in. That is the main cause of dissection of the osteo. So what you should do is, uh, the juniors, you should pull the balloon and the guiding catheter together out first, initially, till the balloon gets released from the stem. Only after the balloon moves out freely into the guiding catheter, then you can engage the guiding catheter and keep the wire also into position. Be careful about this. This is a manual you all of you have to practice to avoid a dissection of the osteum in left main and the osteum of the coronaries as well as grafts. Any, anywhere. This is a mandatory procedure you should learn. Then he mentioned about the proglide. Uh, this is not a uh, catheter which is very familiar to the cardiologist. This is a catheter which is used by the by the radiologist very regularly. It's an unbelievably dexterous catheter. Uh, it is much, much manipulatable than even a, our micro catheters. It, it, contain, it comes with a, a 18 a wire which is also a hydrophilic wire. The proglide, the whole catheter is hydrophilic. It tracks very well. It can go through multiple bends where you find it difficult to access the distal vessels. The proglide is very, very useful in those situations. You should try to learn to use that. It will be very useful in your practice. And uh, the questions were, Deepak, I, I couldn't get through. To the questions, what all were the questions which we have? Sir, how to make an indigenous covered stent with a balloon? Can you cut the balloon and uh, crimp it over a stent and again a stent over the first stent and the balloon sandwiched in between the two stents? Can you do that? Okay. I mean, it, it, it is theoretically it is, uh, it is feasible, but today we don't have bare stents available. The days when we used to have the bare stents, these all possibilities were there, but the balloon material plus another stent technically is very, very difficult. In the desperate situation, much better, much, much better option is uh, take a piece of tagadam and wrap it around the stent and deploy it. That is the easiest way to do. Tagadam, because of it has got the stickiness, it sticks to the stent and it is the elasticity, it just binds onto that and it can be stretched. That is, I've tried several times, it, it is very, very successful. You can use that, it sticks to the stand, and you can certainly do that. Don't try doing a balloon in the stand and trying to uh, put another stand, I mean, stand in, balloon on a stand and another stand on top. Try to avoid that, that can be dangerous because we can lose the stand. Uh, the, Regarding the whether stitching of the vein vein onto a stem, today's stem technically it's very difficult. We used to do that regularly in the days when the, none of the graft masters or cover sets were available. We, the the vein uh, from the leg, leg vein we take it out and stitch it. We ourselves we were bothered about the surgeons. We used to stitch it up. But those were the days when we had the bare, bare stems available to us. You will have to take out the stem from the balloon and then do the stitching. And 
then do it. Today's stent, you cannot do it. And because all the stents are, uh, it, 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 the, will get completely deformed if you try to do any stitching on the present day stents. When you used to have PS153 stent, yes, this was very, very useful and very uh, easy to do it. Today, it's very difficult. Any other comments, any questions, Natarjan Salomani? Deepak, uh, you were talking about taking the second guide. The idea of doing that is to avoid a pericardiosynthesis? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To prevent the leak. Sir, anytime we have a perforation, the most challenging aspect, the most stressful aspect is when you have a tamponade, putting in the catheter inside the pericardium is the most challenging thing. Most of these patients, you have to intubate them ultimately. They are on ventilator. They develop, uh, you need to, uh, they develop uh, elevated counts or the uh, infections, things like that. So uh, avoiding a cardiac tamponade is what I feel is the most important thing while managing a perforation. So that's the, uh, using the second guide, the dual guide is the most easiest way of minimizing the time gap between getting out the balloon and going in with the second covered stent. You said 10 minutes of dilatation with the balloon. Uh, Dr. Matthews sir will be able to tell us you had something called the perfusion balloon in the pre-stent era, right? What is it sir? What is the mechanism? The, the perfusion balloon, actually uh, I was responsible in developing it uh, way back in 1985 and uh, we applied for the patent. Unfortunately uh, Andreas died and all the confusion that went off to somebody else and it came in as Stack perfusion balloon. All our names were taken out of the the list of inventors. The what it used to be, we used to make uh, holes on the shaft of the balloon, avoiding the balloon lumen has got one is the center lumen, second is the side lumen for the balloon inflation. It's withdrawn after crossing the lesion. So what happens is the blood from the, uh, the shaft of the balloon enters through the central lumen of the balloon and goes steady and it was very, very useful. There, are one case, there was one case we put the, in, we inflated the balloon and sealed the dissection and we tried taking it out after 10 minutes, 15 minutes, one hour, it keeps on falling back. We were so desperate we couldn't uh, manage it and as soon as the dissection falls back, the patient becomes very symptomatic. This was Dr. Subramanian's patient. What we did is we inflated the balloon in, in the coronary and left it there, we drew the wire and kept the patient outside the cath lab for a couple of hours, then brought back and checked, still it was not working shifted the patient with the balloon overnight into the CCU and brought her back and checked it and it seed. This used to be a, a very, very regular thing which we used to do was using a perfusion balloon. Unfortunately, the perfusion balloon was a patent of guidance that is uh, present day uh, Abbott. They, they thought the stent will seal everything so they through that and sold that patent to somebody in Japan and this balloon is available in Japan but they don't sell outside Japan. It would have been very very useful catheter, very useful. We used to use it regularly. A few more words and about Protamin Deepak. Sorry sir, you were saying something, I interrupted you. Sorry. No, only, only Deepak did mention uh, uh, once about the massage and disengaging the guiding catheter. It's extremely, extremely important when you are massaging, disengage the guiding catheter. Otherwise, the guiding catheter itself during the massage can dissect the left main uh, or the osteum of the right. Please disengage the guiding catheter. If you have to take a shot, you can advance the guiding, take a shot, again withdraw it back on, on sliding on the wire or the balloon what is inside. Leaving the guiding catheter during massage is extremely dangerous. Please be careful. 
Deepak, I asked But, you about Protamin. You were expressing <clears throat> concern. Sir, what about your experience with Protamin during perforations? Can it be counterproductive, especially after a stent? Um, I, we use it quite regularly, um, Nagarjan. Uh, very often, half reversal of Protamin is extremely useful. And uh, today, when we deploy the stent, uh, optimally, that is... Uh, Um, post dilatation is over. We the stent is well deployed. Then there is no risk of uh, 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 I mean uh, thrombosis uh, in the standard segment. Even if we draw the I mean uh, uh, heparin effect by reversing the protein. There are centers in the US and Europe. They discharge the patients with the uh, stent uh, within six hours of the procedure. If it is a straightforward stent, they will drop. So the heparin is reversed and send them home. If it is properly done stent, I don't think there is any risk at all. Reversing the heparin, protamin is extremely useful, very, very, very safe. Provided you have deployed the stent well. If you have not, then don't try. Sir, as I understand, for a for a stent. what is more important is the dapt and for guide catheter related thrombosis prevention heparin would be more important Correct. so following the procedure when you do not have a guide catheter or when you do not have a sheath inside the vessel uh, there is no role for heparin inside uh, uh, heparin to be continued so that's the reason why there are centers as you told uh, mentioned sir there are centers abroad where they uh, they totally reverse the action of heparin with protamin at the end of the femoral procedure and remove the sheath on the table following a femoral procedure sir what is uh, how do you try to reverse the heparin action sir sir what we try to do is we give 7000 un- units of heparin for a, every intervention to start with so to uh, to totally reverse it we need to we need to use 70 mg of protamin but we do not use 70 mg of protamin we use 25 or 30 or 35 mg of protamin so that we could partially reverse the heparin effect sir what is your now how do you do that sir a lot of people are asked regarding your opinion standard is a half reversal as you said And I mean, ten thousand uh, every you every thousand units is uh, is ten thousand uh, ten milligram. Ten milligram, yes, sir. Yes. Sir. So uh, you, you, if you have you you half reverse it. If you are given seven thousand five hundred thirty five. If you are given ten thousand fifty. Yes, sir. So half reverse it. because invariably our procedure takes about 45 minutes half an hour 45 minutes minimum maybe if there is a perforation we are definitely going to exceed one hour yes sir. but it's a time to reverse it is go ahead and reverse it half that should be enough the calcified lesions when they are over expanded even with one to one balloon artery ratio increases the chance of perforation because there could be differential dilatation of the balloon in non calcified segments so if i make a statement saying that if you have a lower threshold to do debulking with rotablation with your vast experience the risk of perforation becomes lesser will you agree with me definitely yes see what happens once you uh, debulk the whether it is calcified lesion whether it is a fibrotic lesion whether it is only um, atheroma when you push uh, i don't know how many of us are gone to the uh, theater when we send the patient for an emergency surgery or post angioplasty surgery you see in the standard segment actually bulges out from the normal uh, architecture of a st- or of the vessel it is actually bulging out like a worm that is because whatever the material is inside the media or in, inside the intima sorry is pushed out it is not removed it actually stretches the whole artery outside the vessel so if there is a calcium there if you have not debal that calcium itself can perforate the artery yes but uh, how we get away with it debulking will reduce the chances but you have to be very careful in using a high pressure balloons in calcification 
I am still very scared of using an opium balloon in a gasified lesion because I have seen perforations happening even if it is one to one ratio of balloon which you take. Because you have you have not modified the calcium. Calcium is like a metal piece inside. It can be very dangerous. It can perforate. It becomes very very difficult. And worst is. In a calcified lesion, to get a covered stent is next to impossible if you have not debunked. The, the stent will get caught everywhere and you will never get, get it in. It is a, a double warming. One question to Dr. Selvamani. Uh, you, if I make a statement that if you are a very, 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 very diligent operator who looks at angiography in minute detail, if after looking at the angiography in great detail and you don't make out a dissection, uh, by imaging also you won't see a dissection which merits a stenting. Will you agree with me? It is not so, Natarajan, sir. I showed you an example. No? We have uh, certain cases where you really cannot pick up an angiogram. And if somebody has a stent thrombosis or some complication already, it is better you do an imaging if it is available. And... Uh, Many times uh, you will pick up a major dissection. What I was telling was other way round like uh, <clears throat> when you see a uh, dissection in the angiogram, probably most of the time it is a major dissection on imaging. That is what I was meaning. And uh, if you say that if you cannot make out a dissection in angio, still we can make out uh, dissection, major dissections on imaging. That is a possible. That means you should Im imaging is mandatory. Probably if they are standing. Sir, will you agree with that? <laughs> no, I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> what will you say, sir, to that point? No, tell, tell me, tell, tell uh, me again. No, I asked him if the angiography does not show <laughs> any dissection, if you are very hmm. careful in analyzing the angiogram, if I make a statement that imaging will not show a dissection which merits a stenting, to which he said, an angiogram may not show a dissection, but there may still be a major dissection in imaging. And I asked him, that means imaging is mandatory in every stent, every case, is, every case who has a stent. I just wanted your opinion. With your vast experience, will you agree with me? The theoretically right. You see, all this dissection we are seeing now, we have been using IVIS uh, on a regular basis for three years together. But we never picked up many of these dissections. And angiographically, if we don't see, we just forget about it and we got away with it. All this identification of uh, uh, 60 degrees and uh, um, 3 millimeters and all came in only after the, uh, uh, the OCT coming in. Very often you think we are overreacting to what we have been doing. Uh, whether this is right or wrong, it's very difficult to say. But if we look back, we have been leaving all these lesions alone when angiographically we never detected. We, we did have some, very rarely we did have trouble, but it's uh, very often it never happened. It is like uh, I started talking to all my associates and friends. I am sitting in, uh, in, a, uh, in Munar, away from all the COVIDs and uh, away from the Columbia disease uh, prevalent in the cities and talking to my secretary and my associates uh, back in Madras and Bombay, I asked what, what is happening to all the patients which used to come and they used to be waiting this for uh, the procedure. Where are they? I, what is happening? They said they are not coming. So I asked them then does it mean that we were overdoing a lot of procedures which was not necessary? We don't know. But most of these patients are staying back at home and hopefully they are not living comfortably. Otherwise they should have been coming. No? This is uh, a controversy in Kerala. Uh, <laughs> somebody made a comment in the lay, new, lay press and some TV channel also. <laughs> they said like that. But uh, we did an analysis of our data, at least in the Cochin uh, area. We found that uh, most of the peripheral centers are doing uh, what? The peripheral centers are doing more numbers than the major yeah. institutions because referrals and traveling becomes a problem. I'm sure okay. uh, Dr. Deepak also will agree with me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
maybe it's the center decentralization has happened yes sir i think um, now we have to move, move to the peripheral center <laughs> <laughs> you have, you have made the step in the right direction by <laughs> <laughs> are there any more questions deepak yes sir, yes sir. how box? how do you how do you embolize with fat autologous fat fat okay have no anybody, you, you can anybody wants to comment on that do it go ahead see actually uh, when uh, there is a distal perforation like where it, where we was showing the wire perforation most of the time you can treat it with fat what you do is you just at the femoral point you pick up some amount of fat that uh, you take a micro catheter over the wire but before doing that you make sure you see outside itself you put this fat and try to inject contrast whether that fat comes out of the micro catheter sometimes after putting the micro catheter taking the wire fat may not come out you make sure the pieces are adequate that it comes out then you take to the distal part of the uh, wire remove the wire uh, remove the wire and through that micro catheter catheter you can inject this fat or if there is no fat you can inject glue also for that and many times this uh, distal perforation closes with that if you have to do that the prograde is a great catheter to do that uh, you have to push up catheter it's easy to push with that uh, the um, the the catheter which comes along with the prograde to push it in uh, the and to the distal segment is very easy uh, what is happening to yusuf uh, deepak sir yusuf is uh, not uh, he is not picking the phone uh, he is i think he is not busy yes sir yes sir any other question any sir uh, for graph master also do you need any anti coagulation that's one question discharge yes sir, yes, sir. we we keep manage all of them on uh, to uh, the uh, as uh, the dual anti platelet See to give you the little insight onto that. When we initially started standing, we used to do was keep the patient on heparin. In the, uh, to avoid surgery, it's a bailout situation. We used to put the stand in and start warfarin on the same day. Build up the warfarin level to. Uh, at least uh, two times then withdraw the heparin only after that we withdraw the we, we remove the sheet also we keep the sheet for two to three days and the patient and we had hell of a lot of bleeding hell of a lot of problems uh, if we when we looked at the first 23 or 20, 26 cases we had reclosure of the standard the stem in spite of fully heparinized or fully anticoagulated was in almost 23% or 25% so heparin or anticoagulation will not prevent the thrombus formation inside a stem what will prevent is only a proper deployment of a stem and well anticoagulated stem No, so there is no justification in anticoagulating the patient we don't have to worry about that at all we have seen it now practice the whole world has seen it and you can forget about anticoagulation yes sir there is one question matthew sir can you repeat once again how to remove along stent without dissecting proximal artery probably they are meaning uh, how to remove the balloon without dissecting the proximal artery sir you were suggesting no to pull the guide as well as the balloon yeah. so so what i what i said was whether it is rc or left uh, left catheter you need to the balloon 
when you have a long balloon the balloon will be sticking to the stent initially even after deployment it will be very very sticky once you deflate the balloon when you pull the balloon out what will happen is the negative force of the balloon will drive the guiding element inside to avoid that you hold on the you you balloon and guiding catheter so you take your hand off from the guiding catheter shaft hold on to the eye connector and with the last two fingers hold on to the balloon pull balloon and because people are using more and more the push pull uh, eye connectors there you will never have a control on the on the balloon movement so fix your hand on the balloon shaft completely and with the left hand pull the guiding catheter out so you will pull the balloon and the guiding catheter together out at least on 5 uh, mm outside after that the balloon will move freely into the guiding catheter only the initial phase you should be pulling both together out so one more question uh, the difference between graft master and pk papyrus i have not used the uh papyrus but uh, what i heard was that it was not very useful but uh, if you have used it go ahead and comment on it uh deepak you did a case on papyrus you said yes sir yes sir uh, sir basically uh, the graft master you have two stents and in between these two stents you have the ptfe material the covered portion being sandwiched between mm -hmm. these two and uh, regarding the pk papyrus it's just one stent and over the stent you have this material switched on to that so it becomes less a profile and it goes through a five french catheter but uh, based on whatever case i have presented we feel that even the graft master with two stents and a bigger profile it would go through a six french guide catheter or even through a guide sila inside a six french guide catheter not but the biggest one not but the part yes, papyrus sir. papyrus is not ptf it is uh, it is different material which is permeable for uh, blood to get through that yes sir so sir that's so the just, that's the m guard you are speaking about sir papyrus is a ptf uh, sir i'm not sure i i hope so it's again this almost the same material but then the di main difference is there are no two stents with papyrus it's only oh, one cell yes sir yes i think is kind of fixed on to that single yes, stent itself yes sir true sir it is fixed but i i thought that was also porous not sure sir not sure sir. if it was not porous i i am i am certain i think you must refer that that and uh, let us know because if it was not porous they would not have uh, uh, it would have been very very popular yes sir the graft abbot would have closed on the graft master, master business <laughs> if papyrus was uh, uh, not porous sir it's a polyurethane me membrane Elect electrostatic forces spin the polyurethane fibers onto the stent surface creating a thin and highly elastic membrane it, it's not ptfe polyurethane <laughs> membrane then it may not be porous also if it is polyurethane yes sir uh selomani have you used the m guard stent yeah i have uh, but it is not available now uh we have used few m guards like uh, one in acute mi to uh, that was predominantly used to uh, take off that block the clots there from distal embolization we have used in three four cases but not satisfied but i we have used it in two three svg grafts where uh, the distal embolization was really less and uh, probably i i think it was more useful there rather than in primary angioplasty is it but available in, still no it is not available now it's not available apparently lot of dislodgement rates that's yeah. what i read uh, and restenosis was very high when we used in uh, acute mi most of the patient came back after three months or two months with the restenosis because you know it's a bare metal stent it's not a regular stent 
M guard was a bare metal, but uh, we, we have not used it for perforation, but in primary angioplasty and SVG graft. Sir, uh, can I ask you a question, sir? Yeah. Uh, so you must have you must have implanted a covered stent for perforation like indications uh, in your vast mm. practice, and you were once routinely doing follow up angiograms of patients after procedures. What was your experience with these stents during follow up? Is it very bad? No, it is very bad. Very bad. Very bad. We only tied over the crisis of that day. The resources rate was very high. We postponed the emergency for another day. Somebody has asked a question to Deepak. Do you be comfortable leaving Ellis grade one perforation in lab and going home? Grade one. So grade one. Uh, in most of the situations, it should settle down with a prolonged balloon dilatation. So probably one should one should not keep the leak seeing on the monitor and shift the patient to the CCU. Probably one should settle it. One should have a prolonged balloon dilatation, settle it, and then shift the patient to the CCU. A combination of uh, the, the dilatation as well as uh, uh, protomin with the reversal of the heparin with protomin would 99.9% uh, .9 you can send the patient home. That, uh, Sir, the technique, technique of Baroon, uh, buried uh, wire technique was explained last time. Maybe maybe that person did was whoever asked may not have listened to you the last time. Yes, sir. So can uh, just two minutes? Can can I just share a case? Just two minutes. The buried wire. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a. Uh, oops, sorry. This was a very elderly lady. She was very skinny, uh, almost 30, 40 kgs in weight. Uh, she presented with an evolved inferior wall MI. So plan was to manage her conservatively. But because she had recurrence of angina, we took her for an angiogram. Because she was very skinny, we somehow wanted to have the procedure done through the radial approach. The radial artery was too small. So that was the angiographic image. You could see in the right coronary artery, there is a critical, a discrete stenosis and it's a calcified vessel. So we felt that that was the lesion that was producing recurrence of angina. On medication, she had recurrence during the hospital stay. So we thought that we need to stand that particular area alone with a discrete stent. And none of the six French guide catheters would track through the radial artery. So we started doing with a five French guide catheter. That's a five French Jenkins catheter. We do not have any sort of curves with the five, five French. The amplats was not available. So we were we started with the five French Jenkins catheter, wired it, balloon dilated it, and following balloon dilatation, the stent wouldn't track into the into the ves uh, into the vessel. Uh, we further dilated with a uh, three millimeter balloon. In spite of using a three millimeter balloon, we were not possible. We were not able to get the stent across. So at this point of time, we were not, we were left with no other options because uh, through a five French guide catheter, the guide sealer wouldn't track in. So we did not have any other option. Matthew Samuel sir would laugh and tell me that I should have gone through the femoral approach at this point of time. So we did not have any option, but somehow wanted to get the stent across. So we could see that there is some proximal lesion also. So, so what we did was we took the second wire inside the vessel again both were run through wires so took the uh, stent proximally through the first run through wire and deployed the stent proximally when we deployed the stent in the proximal portion we had the second run through wire behind the stent struct so that this would this uh, the stent would bury the wire underneath the stent and this would anchor the guide catheter so that we could get the second stent through the first stent in the distal portion. So the below the, the stent was deployed there in the proximal portion. And following that, with the help of this anchoring effect, we could get the stent. Uh, we did the post dilatations, and that's the second stent coming inside. And with this anchoring technique, with this buried wire anchoring technique, we were able to track the stent distally. You could see that the stent is going in easily. Uh, with the help of anchoring technique and finally 
that was deployed there so just to hide before deploying the second stand one should keep in mind that the buried wire should always be removed that's the most important point because uh, if you keep the buried wire there when you deploy the second stand distally uh, you have the wire buried between two uh, two stands and it might be difficult for you to get the stent uh, uh, buried wire out of the coronary so remove the buried wire and then deploy the stent and finally we will be able to achieve a reasonable result with following post dilatation this is just to highlight the buried wire technique once again thank you so much yes, very good very good it's a good technique uh, very good so just with this five french catheter we never had option we never had any other option to get the stent across into the vessel Uh, that's a good uh, technique uh, the effect but sometime what i have observed is when you have a, uh, uh, some buried wire like this in the distal vessel sometimes even that wire itself may not allow you to take the uh, catheter uh, but sometimes when you stent the proximal segment the angle will change that itself might help you to take the stent we really don't know but sometimes it all these things works but it may not work always true true so this is one occasion where we will stent proximally first and then beyond the stent right no option is, situation sir uh, what is your preferred order sir you will always do the distal first and then the proximal in a in a vessel requiring two stents no uh, see sir, I, I, last time i think uh, we discussed this point the when there is tortuosity when there is calcification and you want to uh, stent distally we such situation also you can do the proximal stent first and then take a stent uh, through the the other stent because the calcium you can uh, take that calcium as well as the multiple bends under the stent so that you can track another stent this is can be used for technique doing that but, but if you have to take a long stent through an uh, through a pre existing stent or pre deployed stent then it's a challenge a short stents that should not be an issue and especially with the new sets of stents the tracking should be very easy so in your stent distally first and come back and do the proximal last was uh, was the key stents and non maneuverable very rigid stents that days are gone today yes sir so one last question sir when you do a, a prolonged balloon dilatation for a perforation did you do you dilate it exactly at the perforation site or proximal to the perforation site exactly at the perforation site because very often there will be retrograde blood also coming that keeps so you have to cover proximal and distal preferably with a longer balloon because that would cover it much better see avoid using a short balloon at the perforated site because that will stretch the artery and the perforation higher if you have a long balloon for example a small perforation if you use a 20 or 30 mm balloon covering the perforation it would be much safer and much better seal you will get sir one more question to you uh, we have seen you manage this particular case what do you do when you have a left main bifurcation perforation how do you manage it in the cath lab uh, i did uh, one surprise i think i showed some film yes sir yes sir yeah see what what happens is it all depends on where you have to <laughs> stand if it is an ostium of the circumflex and you what you can do is go ahead and use a covered stem in extend the protruding from the circumflex into the left knee but before doing that you must have another wire and a balloon in the lady ostium so you would be deploying the stem on an existing balloon in the left main and the lady why because the circumflex stem protruding into the left main if it is a, i'm talking about perforation of the ostium of the circumflex if you don't cover the ostium you will not get a seal 
If you cover the ostium, some part of the stent has to protrude into the, uh, the covered stent has to protrude into the That can seal off your access into the LED. To prevent that, you will have another balloon and a wire in the LED or the second artery, whichever. After post deployment, you have to go ahead and dilate that uh, LED balloon, for example, and create the lumen properly. And then, if there is already a stent in the ostium of the LED, you can leave it alone or get another stent into the LED and simultaneously park it as uh, uh, as the SKS onto the stent, onto the graft master or the covered stent and create a double lumen, one lumen into the LED and one lumen into the circumflex. That way you will establish the blood flow into both. There is one situation where we had well, one of our colleagues uh, was doing uh, a case uh, standing in the LED. He, while deploying the stand, I don't know, think, uh, okay, he, he had a perforation. Then he took a graft master and want to seal that uh, leak in the proximal area. While deploying the stand, and for, after deploying, he pulled the balloon back for a post dilatation, very, very uh, high pressure dilatation. He wanted to do it. What happened? These graft masters, if you are deploying it, you have to deploy it at optimal pressure, and the selection of the stand has to be absolutely correct, one needs to one. If you undersize the balloon, then what happens is the, the stem will free float inside the other stem. When you are withdrawing the stem, the, the graft master or the covered stem can move backwards into the left wing. This is what happened. It moved back. He didn't realize it. He deployed that with the high pressure again. So this stem was protruding into the left main and sealed off the circumflex. It was an anterior or uh, an acute emergency. So, a lady has a compromised flow, TME2 flow, you seal off the circumflex, what will happen? All the hell will be. So, that was the time we tried to get in. We First, we tried to get, go under the stand and get an access into the circumflex. We couldn't. We got a wire in, but we couldn't get a balloon in. The smallest balloon also wouldn't cross. So what uh, we did is I got a, that wire was giving some flow into the circumflex. We left the wire there and kept that access open. Got another access from the opposite side. Brought another guided catheter and engaged and got a microcatheter with a congress probe wire. You can perforate the covered stem. We perforated the covered stem, accessed into the circumflex from the left main and dilated that. Then, then it was easy. We managed to do a kissing balloon with two stems. One was covered stem, one was another stem from the covered stand into the circumflex and got away with it. The various things can be done. That's what I said. A good car, interventional cardiologist has to be a thinking surgeon. Uh, so you have to adapt yourself to a situation, start thinking and you must be able to get out. Sir, moreover, if you want to do an SKS with two covered stents at the left main bifurcation, will it go through a seven French guide? From, you might need a two. Oh, two you guides. need two, two guide again. Two guides. You need two guide again. Deepak, you kept saying that if you have to take a second guide into the coronary artery, you have to withdraw the other. Can you have two guides engaged in the left main? You, 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 very often you can. 
because left main is uh, uh, four millimeter uh, left main, two guide catheters, uh, six French and seven French guide catheters will comfortably sit. But it's always easier to engage. We don't need two guide catheters anyway. You, you need only one to inject. Sir, we, need, we see the no. Japanese operators do that, sir. When you do a CTO in the LAD, when you go through the circumflex artery, seeing them using two guide catheters inside the left main. Yeah, there is no, no problem at all. Okay, Deepak. Okay, it is uh, all good things have to come to an end. <laughs> very good meeting. Very, very enjoyable. Very learning. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, Nandarajan, Deepak, Sarvamani. It was a nice evening. Well spent. Thank you very much, sir. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. See you. Thank you, sir. Hello, Mani, Deepak. See you. Thank bye. You, good night. Good night. Bye, sir. Bye, bye.